1928, the Surrealists' favorite photographer was a machine, the photo booth, an American invention recently arrived in Paris. André Breton, Paul Éluard, and Louis Aragon soon discovered a creative way to use the photo booth, which made self-portraiture available to all. In these passport photos, surrealism has two faces, one totally anti-conformist, the other ultra-serious, like these of André Breton, the movement's leader. The same blend of seriousness and humor marked their approach to photography. On the one hand, they were obsessed by the disciplined and cold objectivity of the machine, the automatic nature of which reflected their own experiments in writing, the writer being, according to André Breton, a humble recording machine with no more talent than a mirror or a door. On the other hand, they mocked photography's pretentious claim to faithfully depict what is real and enjoyed the ease with which they could misappropriate it. Man Ray. Kiki de Montparnasse metamorphosed into a cello with a touch of Indian ink. Nothing proves the truth of surrealism like photography does, wrote Salvador Dali in 1925. It's the surest vehicle for conveying poetry, the best instrument for perceiving the relationship between reality and surrealism. As a raw document, a photograph was able to capture the unintentional poetry of painted funfair scenery. An unplanned meeting, captured by Man Ray, or the Chaboté, or Puss in Boots, and the Marquis de Sade on a street corner in Antibes, or an oddly dressed pharmacy window. The photographer of these pictures, the Czech Jindrik Sturski, photographs these quaint settings, refusing all artistic manipulation and intent in order to capture as simply as possible the surrealism hidden in reality itself. The only sign of his presence is the barely visible reflection of his body, seemingly struggling to support the bearded dummy's head. Another storefront, Optical Parable, by Mexican photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo, 1931. Nothing seems to escape the view of the artificial eyes that fill and define the framing. Nothing except for this. The photo was printed back to front. The photo of the storefront is merely a reflection. That's the meaning behind the parable. Photography is not the true image of reality it claims to be. The world it shows is a trick. Its trick is so extraordinary that we fail to notice it. By freezing the instant, Photography removes the difference between the animate and the inanimate. The most familiar objects, like a dress hung out to dry in a yard, photographed here by Miroslav Hack in 1944, take on a life of their own in a world that becomes foreign to us. A world inhabited by ghosts. This one by Marcel Marianne in 1952 is entitled Staircase spirit. In such images, there is no human presence, as if the world of objects were waiting for us to be gone before revealing its troubling strangeness. But sometimes that's not enough. To catch the statue of Marshal Ney in Paris by surprise in 1932, Versailles had to wait for nightfall.
Through the photographer's lens, the statue and the street lighting, tied together forever by the fog and the setting, face off, both solitary actors in a new story being played out in our absence. Man is sometimes allowed into this world of objects, but only as one of the objects. Claude Caun, Study for a Memory, 1925. The photographer's head is shut in a bell jar, like a biblo protected from dust. Curiously, the same idea appears in a 1930 photograph by Man Ray, in the review Surrealism at the Service of the Revolution and entitled Homage to Saad. Not to be confused with another Man Ray photograph later in the same edition, Monument to Saad. Homage or monument? It's a question of nuance. Headless bodies or bodiless heads? One way or another, surrealist man is always cut along the line that passes between the body and head, between instinct and reason. René Magritte, The Giant, 1937. Two more headless figures, photographed in 1935 by Dora Maar. The first has lost his head in a manhole. Realism itself, captured at the right instant, cuts him in two. But cutting is one of the qualities of framing, as the second figure finds out to his expense. Livorno, 1936. A man reading a newspaper. Henri Cartier-Bresson was a few steps away. Between his lens and the man's head, a knotted curtain. Calculated or coincidental. By playing with the position and distance, the photographer replaced the man's head with the knot, creating a being both commonplace and disturbing, a latter-day monster. In 1936, André Breton published Beauty Will Be Convulsive in the review Le Minotaur, an article defining surrealist aesthetics, illustrating it with a photograph by Man Ray, for which Breton himself had found the title, Explosant Fixe. There are two other photos taken during the same performance. Good quality snaps, but without interest, except to fans of flamenco. Explosant Fix, however, is a picture that a good technician would consider failed. The movement, too fast for the camera's settings, is out of focus. But this imperfection, intentional or not, we'll never know, frees the image from its context. It's no longer the dancer Prue de Pilar that we're looking at, but movement itself, energy, captured, fixed in its purest state. Man Ray was a jack-of-all-trades, painter, filmmaker, and quasi-official photographer of a movement to which he never officially belonged, preferring pleasure to theory, free experimentation to the group theory imposed by André Breton. Return to Reason, 1924. Man Ray observed the play of light and shade on an egg box, then on the breasts of his model, Kiki de Montparnasse,
From a photogram of this sequence, he would print one of his best known photographs. Frozen, the lines of shade take on the savage air of a ritual mask or the coat of a big cat. Lee Miller, another of his models. In 1930, Man Ray photographed her from above, her body hidden by black cloth. But this was only the point of departure. For the print, the picture was repositioned, reframed, and touched up to make the cloth disappear. Finally, it was simply turned upside down. The familiar facial features remain, but out of place. Lee Miller has become a humanoid from an unknown species. Conversely, Lee Miller photographed from below, her head thrown back. The photo was then reframed, making the model's real pose incomprehensible. The title? Anatomy. The photograph acts as a scalpel, cutting away appearances to reveal a mass of flesh and muscle, somewhat mysterious and completely phallic. To a rather kitsch photo of a face covered in glass tears, in the dark room, Man Ray reframed it and blew up the detail. Like a microscope, the close-up opens the doors to another world where form and matter supplant all meaning. The noblest of animals has, however, a body with feet, by which I mean it has feet, and these feet live an independent life that is ignoble," wrote George Bataille in 1934, in text accompanied by photographs by Jacques Boiffard. Here the close-up isn't used, as it is by Man Ray, to surprise or seduce, but to shock by showing us what we have no desire to see, the base matter of which we are made. It's an attack on good taste, a new way of freeing the eyes. There's no difference between a human mouth, photographed by Roger Perry, and the mouth of a fish by Jean Pinlevé, the pioneer of scientific photography. And what could be more human than this sad-looking little creature, probably an armadillo fetus, through which photographer Dora Maar invites us to recognize our own monstrous nature? Jean Pallavé, self-portrait superimposed on a photograph of a spider, 1929. Magnify the real to reveal the surreal, said Salvador Dali. But in this magnification, there may be a violence that the human eye finds unbearable. Then what answer is there other than closing our eyes and seeking refuge in an interior world? That's the flip side of surrealist photography, the real attacked by the dream. Optics and chemistry no longer reproduced, but dissolved the world's solid forms. Distortion number 34 is one of a series of photographs by André Cortez in 1933 using deforming mirrors. It was a commission for a review that had supplied the mirrors and models, a process halfway between Salvador Dali's soft watches and a fairground hall of mirrors.
Simpler, yet even more disturbing, another reflection photographed by Raoul Ubach in 1938. The face of his wife Agui in the sunlight fades into the shadows of a mirror with damaged silvering. Photography itself can become a mirror in which reality joins its reflection. Moi et moi by Arthur Harfou. The doubling up is obtained by exposing the same negative twice. In the 19th century, this process was called ghost photography. But there are no ghosts in this photo. Here, the double image depicts the conscious and the subconscious, waking man and sleeping man. You can also take two different negatives and superimpose them during printing, as Man Ray did in 1921. In one, a bare-breasted woman in front of a wallpapered wall. In the other, the poet Tristan Zara at the top of a ladder, an axe suspended above his head. Eyes, poses, and perfectly positioned hands make what should be an impossible picture wholly probable. If you briefly expose a print to light while it's being developed, it produces solarization, the partial inversion of light and shade. The effect heightens outlines and gives the photograph an artistic, graphic style. But the process can't be controlled. Chemistry does what it likes. As the title of this 1929 solarized photo by Man Ray so aptly puts it, the primacy of matter over thought. A further step in the same direction was taken by Raoul Ubach. Brûlage, or heatage. The negative plate is heated intensely, causing the emulsion to melt. As Ubach said, it's a destruction reflex, the total dissolving of the image towards the absolute informal. I treated most of my negatives this way. The result, more often than not, was disappointing save for one with a woman in a bathing suit who turned into a stunning goddess. La Nebuleuse, 1939. Once the photographer has gone, you just need to get rid of the camera. Man Ray had experimented with the process on film. You roll some virgin stock in a dark room and sprinkle it with various things. Salt, pepper, pins, nails, springs. Then you switch the lights on and off. Develop the film and watch it. The traces of objects, imprints, a subtraction of light. Man Ray baptized photographs like these rayographs. The Kiss, 1922 a photo produced in three stages. First, the hands, placed on a large glass negative in a dark room. Then, the two faces kissing, once again placed flat, Man Ray himself and Kiki de Montparnasse, both in acrobatic positions. But the imprints of the hands and faces are too literal, too easily understandable. So these are broken and recomposed by two foreign bodies, two development tanks which impose a new geometric and formal duality. We went to the antipodes of photography, 
Man Ray wanted to rid it of all references to reality. I looked for surrealism in realism itself, wrote Brassai, author of this 1932 photograph, The Phenomenon of Ecstasy. But to follow through this search for the surreal, one picture, however beautiful, would not suffice. The following year, Brassai's photograph would find itself included in another work surrounded by 24 photographs of human faces, four of statues' faces, 16 of men's ears, one of a balancing chair, and one of a modern-style pin. The Phenomenon of Ecstasy, 1933. Photo montage by Salvador Dali. It's a collection of images deviated from their real meaning in the purest tradition of surrealism. The photographs of angled faces evoke ecstasy in a direct way. The others are more enigmatic. The ears, borrowed from Alphonse Bertillon's police identity photos, only take on meaning once you know that Dali believed the ear was the one organ in constant ecstasy. The group of three people is a pornographic photo with the bottom cut off. The pin is a phallic symbol. The chair, one of Dali's works photographed by Man Ray, is there to echo the angled heads. The images are assembled in a parody of a synoptic tableau which gives fantasy an air of discipline. Here, beauty is not the aim. What counts is the shock between fragments. Not even Brassai's photo resists the brutality of the cutting and splicing that nothing can hide. We're not meant to see the reality of each picture, but the reality of their montage. In the world of dreams, it's different. Here, wiping out the traces is important. This little picture postcard Minerva looks quite at home in this photo montage by Dora Maar. She's at the right scale and correct distance from the strange pair of boys in the foreground. It's impossible to see that they too have been cut and pasted and that the setting itself is an assembly of two photos of different places, the position of the two boys masking the splicing of the faked perspectives. All the features blend into each other, as illustrated by the two bodies whose pose seems both real and faked. Nothing can be more removed from the elaborate dreamlike scene of Dora Maar than the seemingly apparent realism of this photograph by Yindrik Stursky. And yet, everything rests on the meticulous adjustment of two planes, the real plane of the dais with the chair and instruments left by the musicians, and the imaginary plane of the painted backdrop. Stursky joined the two planes by fixing the height of his camera in such a way that the top of the chair coincides with the wire of the tightrope walker bridging the gap between our world and hers. Finding surrealism in the real, or the real in a dream, depends solely on the position of the photographer. And, as the Surrealists loved misappropriation, to conclude, we shall take the liberty of pirating this vessel, shot by Dora Maar for a hair lotion ad, and dedicate it to all those who, according to André Breton, safely sailed the ship of photography through the almost incomprehensible swirls and eddies of images.